The member who's arresting upstairs is also what's called the book person. And that's the person who drives the truck, and I'll, uh, we'll show you that later. That's the um, what we also call the radio room. And so when he or she gets woken up, they're all out of bed, they're flicking on all the lights also. So now when we come back, we're not coming back to a dark station. And they also acknowledge the receipt of the alarm to make sure that we know, yeah, we got it. So I just want to check sure, make sure if I got this right. So a shift for you guys is 24 hours. And Correct. Throughout the whole 24 hours, you can't sleep at all. Like you just take like rest, but you don't fully sleep. You, yeah, you, you can rest. I mean, you do, am I going to say you don't fall asleep? Yeah, you, you fall asleep, but you know, if those alarms go off or there's something that needs to be done, then we're up doing it. So it's, you know, it's not like at home where you just sleep through the whole night. Think, think anybody have dogs? Mm -hmm. I have cats and they wake me up. Yeah, so. and they wake you up. Yeah. They, and you got to take care of them, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing. Well, they just want attention. Yeah, well, they want attention and they want to be eating. You know, they want food or something. My, I have three dogs. One of my dogs wakes me up right when the sun comes up. So I'm always up at 530. You got to take them for a walk. Got to, you know, feed and everything. Same thing here. If an engine breaks, if we come back from a call, we could be fixing it for three hours. From like, you know, if we get a call at 1 a.m., come back at 2 we're working from two to five, and then if you get a if you get a call any time after, I'd say three or four a.m., you you're not going back. The rest It's just not happening. You know, by the time you get back, you're all pumped up from the call and everything, and you just it takes a long time for that body to slow down, so you go back and rest and everything. Even if you've been working, even if we have a working fire, and we're pulling hoses, pulling ceilings, and everything. You just you cannot go back to sleep. You know? Um so 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 just a question is so so you guys are trained not only in fire safety but also like um like car like just just that you know how to like repair stuff and like car like like car mechanic but kinda like that? Not everybody is. But we what we do is we all feed off of each other. Mm -hmm. So there's everybody everybody has a talent. Everybody can do something. So, what are we gonna, you know, if this person needs help fixing this, this mm -hmm. person knows how to fix it, they're gonna work together and they're gonna fix it. Mm -hmm. So not everybody, you know, not everybody's an expert at everything. And that's the great thing about the fire service is we all know that and we all work as a team. There was a great movie out years ago, probably before, or probably when some of you were born, called Hoosers. And it's about a basketball team in Indiana and the coach says that there is not one single player on the team. You all function as one unit. And that's how you win games, and that's how you, you, know, you play the game and everything. You know, everybody on the court all functions as one unit. That's how we work. Yeah, there may be somebody like at a fire who's on the nozzle. Hey, not everybody can be the quarterback, but there's somebody else backing them up. There's somebody venting the windows or venting the roof. There's another member searching. If we don't have all those components working, we're not gonna be able to do our job. So if one person's just good at all that and nobody else is, it's not gonna work. So that's why we have everybody, you know, get together. We always train together. We always share knowledge and information together. And that's how we uh, get through the day. So I guess to become a firefighter, you have to not only like take fire, the whatever training is for be a firefighter, but you also take training to, for something else, I guess? No, not really. Um, the only training that requires is firefighting training. And um, after 2007, we've required all firefighters to be emergency medical technicians. Uh, how often do you respond to calls and does your area have an ambulance call? We do have an ambulance squad. It's the Milburn Short Hills Volunteer First Aid Squad. They respond to most of the calls, but they need help during the night. So if there's a, if their main ambulance is out and they have what's called a backup call, we get called out for that, and we go and assist with the patient until we don't transport, but we'll assist with the patient until another ambulance, either from Milburn, Short Hills, or another town gets there. So like in that instance, you'll be the first ones there. Correct. And as we move farther down the road, that's probably going to change even more. We'll be going out to assist 
the first aid squad on calls 24-7. And do you guys feel like you have difficulties, say, taking out the engine or responding? And say, do you wear, like, your bunk out gear also to the medical call? No. No, the bunker gear, we only wear to fire calls. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's just quicker to get in the apparatus and easier to belt yourself in if you're just going to a medical call, you don't need the gear. The other thing is there's a, um, a chemical in our gear called PFOS, uh, polyfluorine, oxins, some and other. It's, it's basically um, an, a, a, a chemical, it's called a forever chemical, and it's supposed to be a barrier uh, a moisture barrier to prevent our gear getting all soaked from our sweat and everything. So there's a lot of talk right now of trying to get rid of that chemical in the gear, but it's very, very hard to do. Um, if you want a good um, film, if you go on Amazon and uh, look up The Devil We Know, that is all about PFAS and the DuPont company. Fire retardant, yeah. Pajamas it's, and, it's it's fire yeah. retardants. It's it's uh, Teflon, mm -hmm. things you use in, in a Teflon pan, and it's it's called a forever chemical, and it's uh, it's unfortunately still around and doing a lot of damage. Um, but yeah, the fire retardants and um, you know the the pla everything's synthetic, so everything's burning now. And our, even though we have extractors, and I'll show you the extractors to wash our gear, it doesn't get everything off. So the less we contaminate our body with that gear, the better. So if it's a medical call or like a house lockout, we'll just put the gear off to the side and then we'll, we'll just respond. And then that way the gear's on the apparatus if we need it, but we're not always gonna wear it. So just to, oh sorry, just to make a point that you're, you are first responders and yet by the continual, continuous use of your own equipment, you, you endanger yourself. That is correct. Right, right now, that, that, is, that is the theory. There is still a lot of science. I go to cancer conferences every year. That's one of my uh, big things here in the department. Mm -hmm. And they're still looking in the PFAS and how it, um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there that have shown documentations that, yeah, it, it does do, uh, it can do damage to the system. One of them being a uh, widow of a Worcester, Massachusetts firefighter lieutenant who died of uh, prostate cancer, and she has been studying PFAS and gear for many, many years now, and uh, she has been actually to show very good data on it. Wow. So, yeah. So it, it acts as a fire retardant for in, within your gear. Is, it, is that fair to... That fire retardant to and a mo it moisture barrier. It has three layers. There's the outer shell, the inner shell, and then there's the moisture barrier. Mm -hmm. And the moisture, like, because what happens is when we wear that gear, it's hot and heavy. It's hot and heavy, and when you you guys work out, go to gym class and everything. What's the mm -hmm. first thing you do within five minutes? You sweat, right? And why are you sweating? Because you're you're working. That's energy. You're taking the food and everything that's in you, and it's burning. It's being used for fuel, and you're so you're sweating. Well, with us, that sweat collects within our gear and makes it very ha heavy. And we also lose a lot of um, blood plasma because we're sweating. We're constantly sweating in that gear. So that's why firefighters are always told to hydrate constantly uh, throughout the day. So in case there is a fire or something that we're well hydrated and we're not gonna have any cardiovascular events from that. Hmm. Is there any, uh, I guess what I, I'm thinking just in terms of a uh, is there any like a uh, uh, way for firefighters to to actually keep track of their hydration or to monitor their own body's hydration? Um, there is. Mm -hmm. It can be done in the morning. Uh, basically, you weigh yourself and then you take in a good a couple of you know quarts of water mm -hmm. and then you weigh yourself again and see how. That's the basis of it. I don't think it really works all that well. I think you just have to. Be smart, if you're be smart about it right. and just you're keep bringing it, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I do one cup of coffee in the morning, one cup of coffee in the afternoon, that's it. The rest of it is water. Mm -hmm. I have a very large jug that I'm drinking and I just constantly drink water throughout the day. Wow. Um, I'm, I don't want to, I want these, these folks to ask the questions, so. Um, I was going to ask, like, what do you do, like, when you train with your team? Like, what is, like, the fundamentals? Well, there's a lot of fundamentals. There's, um, 
There's search and rescue, there's ladder raises, there's a uh, hose deployment, uh, there's using a nozzle uh, to put out the fire, there's, ra um, there's ropes and knots, there's um, heavy rescue such as auto extrication with the jaws. Um, so, so there, I mean, it's a wide variety. It's a very long list of everything that we, uh, you know, and in addition to that, we have to do in January, we have to refresh CPR and bloodborne pathogens and right to know, which is hazmat. Uh, those are the three major things. And then also twice a year, we go to a fire academy and do what's called the live burn, where we actually have live fire and put it out. Does any of this take like a physical toll on you? Absolutely. I am 52 years old right now. I have been with this department since August of 1988. I started as a volunteer and then I became a career member in October of 2000. And it, my knees hurt, my back hurts. So I have three years left until I can retire. And I can tell you right now, when those three years are up, I will be retired. I will do something else. You know, luckily for me, I was smart. Not, not everybody does it, but I went for my uh, bachelor's and master's degree in emergency management. So I'm gonna get a job somewhere else, doing something else with, the, you know, sitting behind a desk or something. This is a very young person's job. So men and women who join, you know, join at a young age, the cutoff is, I think 35, you can't be any older than 35. If you pass it, if you take the test, pass it 35, you can't get hired. Um, but yeah, no, very young person's job, very physically demanding, just, just waking up in the middle of the night, going to calls, physically demanding. And then, you know, if you have fires, auto accidents, whatever, you're lifting heavy equipment, you have to move very expeditiously, very quickly to be able to do all the tasks that you need to do. Um, is there anything like that you had to learn to be a firefighter that you never thought you would end up using or just didn't really make any sense until you ended up using it? Um, for me personally, no, but that, um, it, it's hard to, you know, I mean, a, a 34 year career, mm -hmm. it's, it, I'm sure it's somewhere down the road. I, I passed it where I was like, yeah, oh wow. You know, this was a good technique that somebody taught me that I was actually able to use once or twice. I, I'm sure mm -hmm. it's happened to pretty much everybody on this department and every other department, but um, I can't tell you exactly what it was. Is there, is there anything that either like thinks about firefighting in general that maybe annoy you or like- Pet peeves? Like maybe pet peeves or like anything that you feel could change? Um, feel could change. I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, definitely communications with the uh, way we get dispatched and everything could be, you know, could be a little better. Um, you know, I mean, is there always a simpler way to, uh, what's up, Brock? What's up? Is there always a simpler way to do a task? Yeah, there, there, there might be. There might be. Um, the one thing I learned going to school is, uh, any of you ever hear of Fred Frederick Taylor? Frederick Taylor was the father of scientific management. And he used conveyor belts and um, assembly lines, like how they uh, put automobiles together and everything. And he tried various different ways. He was looking for the one best way to do something. And after all the scientific methods of using personnel, using conveyor belts, using assembly lines, and whatever else he used, he found that there was no one best way to do anything. So there's a lot of good ways, but there's no one best way. You're, not, you're never gonna, and especially in the fire service, because there's always something unique that we're gonna come into that we're like, we didn't expect this, or we didn't expect the fire to travel like this. So it's, you know, it's hard, you know, it's hard to say if there's like um, something better out there or something that would help us more. Um, when, when you're communicating with, uh, with 
people on the job is they're normally a problem or so it can be because we have mountains in the area some there are some dead spots in the uh, municipality so sometimes on the radio it's hard to communicate are you using i'm sorry are you using uh, cells or are you using simplex uh walkies how are you yeah we're using um we're using um walkie talkies mm -hmm. um and, and they're the technology is better, but it's still over the air, and we have a lot of antennas. Like they, at, at the Short Hills Mall, they just had to put antennas up to uh, help us talk within the mall. Because you go in the mall, your radio starts beeping, and it's like you can't hear a thing. Okay. So in all of your years of service, what is the piece of gear, or like the wide range of gear, that breaks the most? Like you have to fix constantly. Um, well, our turnout gear is good between 10 and 15 years, depending on how busy we are we each year. Um, pro probably the, um, the tool that, that breaks the most is the apparatus. Whether it's the tower ladder or the engine uh, or the rescue or the beast unit, because we are constantly going in and out the door. You know, we're driving, we're stopping, we're driving, we're stopping. It's just, you know, it, we leave the engines on when we're, you know, at an incident. So it takes a lot of beating. A lot of beating. Um, so you would say that car service is something good to know? It can be, but we have um, a set of dedicated mechanics. Mm -hmm. Who've well, gone to mechanic school? It's not required, but they can, so they can fix all the apparatus here. Uh, actually, uh, Captain Lynn, who's the OIC today, he's very, very good at mechanics, and he does a lot of maintenance on all these rigs. And we have a handful of others too. Oh, in the back. So when you're um, going to like a call on site, who would typically like be in like the truck? Uh, it would be a officer, like captain, like myself a driver, and one or two firefighters in the back. Only one or two? How much does the vehicle fit? Uh, you can probably put up to six. But that's manpower shortage. That it, I mean, if you ask any firefighter what's the problem in the fire service today, it's uh, manpower. And don't, uh, manpower is just a word. It, uh, that means male or females firefighters. We just call it manpower, though. But there's never enough. Could we use a lot more firefighters on this department? Absolutely. They are building like crazy in this town. We have a whole bunch of apartment complex going up, and right now we're fighting to try to get more firefighters on this department. Is there any concerns? Do you have any concerns about the new apartment buildings? Like, oh, yes. Yeah. They're all wood. They're all wood. Wood is the worst thing that can burn. There's uh, five types of construction. What is fire resistant? And that would be like the um, like the World Trade Center was. Um, World Trade Center was a different animal though because you had fires on many floors. Nobody ever designed a building for there to be fire on like 20 floors at a time. And that's why it collapsed. But fire resistant, um, which doesn't mean fireproof because the contents inside, if you, if you have an oven and your chicken catches on fire, your oven isn't gonna burn, but that chicken is still gonna burn. So you have a fireproof building with combustibles on the inside of it. So that's fire resistant. Then you have limited combustion, which is just a, kind of like a skeleton of a building put up. And it's very weak. We, we try not to go in there if we don't have to. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't burn, but the steel will melt at a thousand degrees and the building just comes down very quickly. Then next to that, you have ordinary construction, which is wood frame, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, brick with wood on the inside. So think about a, a, the way it was described to me by a deputy chief from New York City is a, think of a lumber yard surrounded by four brick walls. That's ordinary construction. So the old walls are outside brick, but everything inside, and that has a lot of voids, and voids are, when you take utilities, and you put utilities, uh, you put utilities in, you have to drill a hole. Now that used to be a fire barrier, like this. 
if I put this up and I have a fire and it's trying to hit that, there's a rating that this is going to withhold the fire for maybe two hours or something. But now I think it's a hole, drill a hole for plumbing, an electrical system, or a cable system or something. I just ruined that fire rating. Now they put a little gel around it or whatever, but fire and heat still has a way to get through. It still has a way to get through it. So that's um, that's order, ordinary construction. Uh, number four is uh, wood uh, heavy timber, and that's like your mills. Uh, that also can involve churches, and uh, it's just very very large dimensional lumber, with the minimum amount of lumber for each beam being eight by eight inches. And then the last one is type five, which is wood um, wood frame construction. That's what you mostly have in anywhere with the exception of maybe Manhattan. You have wood frame buildings and now they're building these wood frame buildings. They're building them higher and higher and higher. Um, if you guys uh, saw a couple years ago, there was the Edgewood yeah. uh, or Edgewater fire where they had that whole complex burn. That was a wood frame apartment building. They're building them all down here now. And it's just, uh, they're very dangerous buildings and they hold a lot of people and they can burn very quick. So like, what are your main concerns? Like saying we have to put men or the firefighters inside the buildings? Like, what is like the main concern in some of those type of wood buildings or any buildings in general? Well, any buildings, you don't want them getting killed. That's the number, life safety is the number one for us and for anybody else in the building is life safety. So if it's us as the civilians in the building, we want to get them all out. If we lose the building, it becomes a parking lot. So be it. So I, I have a question or just your opinion, but when I was li living in Switzerland, uh, most people lived in apartment complexes and most of these apartment complexes were built out of like concrete or brick and most of the time they didn't have uh, fire alarms installed. Um, just Some people did live in houses, but most people lived in apartment complexes and they were built out of cement. What is your opinion on not have, doing, doing this and not having fire alarms? Um, you should always have fire alarms because oh. the, the smoke can travel. But the thing about Europe, like Switzerland and all those mm -hmm. places, is a lot of their buildings are very compact and tight, so there's not a lot of fire spread. But there is a lot of smoke spread in that fire, and smoke has a lot of trouble getting out of concrete buildings. So, you know, I'm not sure of the fire codes over there, but I would, if, if I was in any building and I was sleeping there, I'd want, I'd want a fire alarm. i want a smoke alarm. Mm -hmm. i want a smoke alarm and i want a carbon monoxide alarm. Well, folks, any other questions? Any other? Yeah, go ahead. So, or right, Ivan is first. So if, like, is there any problem when like, you're trying, like, let's say a building is like on fire, right? Is there any problem with finding the source of the fire? Oh, absolutely. And I'll show you what we use for that. Uh, it's a thermal imaging camera. When we go out to the floor, I'll show you what that is. But yeah, uh, if you look at a building from the outside, you see a lot of smoke, you don't know where that fire is. You can kind of judgment where, where it might be, where the seat of the fire is, but a lot of times you have to go, and that's what the engine company does. The engine company's job is to locate, then confine, then extinguish the fire. So find it, confine it to the area that's burning, not necessarily put it out, but once you confine it, then you can put it out. Because confining it's going to prevent it from spreading to other areas of the building, allow occupants to get out. So figure if you have a uh, two-story wood frame house and you have fire on the first floor, you find the fire on the first floor, you want to confine it so those people can come down the stairs and then you, once everybody's out of the building, then you go with extinguishment. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. So when you like reach like the active site, like what are like the first like safety precautions you take? So when you're, you're saying when you arrive on scene? Mm -hmm. You arrive on scene, you make sure that all your equipment's on properly and there's really no skin exposed and you have the, uh, you have your 
SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus on, so you're not breathing smoke or any of the heated gases, and you have your helmet on. You have your tools, whether it's a uh, halogen and a flathead axe, um, or if it's, um, you know, your thermal imaging camera or your hose. So you have to be, when you're going to these incidents, you always have to be prepared. Even if it turns out to be nothing, you still have to be fully dressed in your SCBA and everything ready to go. And then how do you determine whether, like, what steps to take, like, towards, like, the, let's say it's a house fire, like, how do you know, like, what to do first? Like, how do you assess the building? What we do is a size up. And um, a lot of that has to do with, what well, start is the time of day is very important. You, know, you, you always have people who work nights or you work days or whatever. So there's always going to be somebody in the building. But there's more likeliness of people being in a building at 2 o'clock in the morning, let's say 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm not saying that somebody's not taking a nap at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but you know you have a higher life hazard at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, signs up is also going to take in um, the type of building it is. We talked about the five types. Is it wood frame? Is it this? Is it that? Because fire travels differently in each one of them. You also have to you know, determine how much more manpower you're going to need to put this fire out. Do we call mutual aid? Do we you know, call more units in? Um, the weather is gonna be a factor. You know, what are, people are inside more in the winter than they are in the summer. So you're gonna, um, that's gonna be a factor. Um, your height of the building, you know, height is gonna determine, you know, how many more units you're gonna need. If you have a fire on the first floor of a six story building, where's all that smoke gonna go? going to go up, right? So that's going to affect the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth floor. So you got to do a lot, you got to use a lot of manpower to search that building. Now, if it's on the top floor, it's still a problem, but not as much of a problem. Because that smoke can just kind of go out the roof. You can open up the bulkhead door, let the smoke go out. So, and the area, how deep do we have to go into this building? How, you know, from the street? There's also like some houses, some buildings, where the first floor is here, but in reality, in the back, it drops down. So the first floor might be two floors below. A uh, big area like that is Overlook Hospital. Overlook Hospital, when you walk into the lobby, you're walking into the fifth floor because it's on a mountain. So the front of it, yeah, you think you're in the lobby, but that's actually the fifth floor. And like I said, the depth of it, you know, how far, how big is this building? How much fire load do we have? How many civilians might we have stuck in the building? Um, so, just a question is, do you think that the fire department vehicles will switch over to more electric vehicles, and do you think that there's the possibility of fire departments, um, or in the future having, like, fire engines that don't require someone to drive them, and they drive on their own and put out the fire on their own, but you still need people to dispatch to the place just in, like, a van or whatever? Uh, answer to your first question, there actually is a electric fire truck out there now. I think Arizona, or somebody is using it. They just bought the first all-electric fire engine. Uh, do I see that happening in my lifetime? No, because I only have three years left. But um, for the future, absolutely. In answer to your second question, too much of a liability for somebody to not be behind the wheel of an apparatus. How much, do, how much does a gallon of water weigh? Everybody know? Like eight and a half pounds. Each one of those engines out there carries 500 gallons of water. The tower ladder weighs, yeah, the tower ladder weighs even more than that with all its components and tools on it and everything. It would be foolish for somebody to design a fire apparatus that drives itself. And besides, we need the personnel. So, <clears throat> Because what would happen is the municipality would say, oh, it drives itself, so we can take away two firefighters from every shift from you. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. We want it to be safe, and believe me, people do not pull over for fire engines. They don't, they just run red lights, so we always have to keep our foot over the brake. So there's a lot of, a lot of safety aspects with driving a fire apparatus. And we have to go through a certified vehicle operator course every two years. 
before anybody, even if you don't drive fire apparatus, you still have to go through that course so, you know, so the officer knows what the firefighter driving should be doing. So electric, absolutely you'll see it. Driverless, never see it. Yeah, it's, uh, it, if I might jump in, I would say fire, fire trucks are the, they don't follow rules of the road. They don't, they're not meant to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're setting up an algorithm for an autonomous vehicle, it, it, it's sort of breaking the rules that you're setting for it right away. Mm -hmm. Because I, I understand how advanced self-driving is becoming. Like, mm -hmm. there's even, like, now, soon going to be, like, taxis that are going to come to your location, and they're going to be able to pick you up without a driver. So that was just my question of, do you think it become more advanced and eventually be able to do something? I don't think the fire service will ever see that. I, I, I just don't think it's practical. Plus, you're, you lose man, uh, manpower and you need men and women hopping off the apparatus, as many as you can get, you know, to, to get there and everything. And not to mention, somebody's got to put in the components. I mean, remember, any computer, any machine mm -hmm. is only as good as the data that we, the humans, put into it. So somebody's got to put all that data in and find somebody to do that and paying somebody to do that under a municipal budget, which is all funded by taxes and nothing else, not going to happen. Uh, when you get to a, an accident or a fire, do you uh, have a problem surveilling the area? What we do, what I do as an officer, is I do a 360, and I encircle the area that's on fire. If I can, sometimes you can't, sometimes there's fences, animals that get in the way, but usually I do a 360, walk around and take in a whole picture as part of my size up, and then I determine what we need. So do you do that 360 like walking? Yeah, or a, a brisk walk. Um, do you think that like, an algorithm that could uh, calculate or like evaluate the whole 360. Like you just walk around with the camera, and the camera uh, goes through like an algorithm to evaluate it. Do you think that could be practical? No, because there's so many variables, either at a fire or an accident scene or an EMS. You have to be looking. You no, know, what are you looking for? You're looking a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, these emergencies are caused by human error. Whether it's driving too fast, whether it's you left food on the stove, or you left a, uh, a candle burning the house. So as a human, I know what to look for as human error. And I need to know where the fire started. I need to know how it started. I need to know how many people are inside. That, you know, for an algorithm to try to do that, you have, you know, there's, there's going to be errors with anything. Even with the humans doing the 360, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to, you know, do a search. We're going to miss an area. But I don't think an algorithm to do a 360 would be appropriate because there's only so much an algorithm could do. Whereas, a, you know, I could walk around and then I can have one of my firefighters walk around who's maybe more senior to me, has some more years on it, and say, oh, you know what, Cap, you forgot this. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, you, you know, you wouldn't want to miss anything. What about um, when you're clearing a building that's smoke-filled? Uh, what's your vis? Like, how do you see around you when you're in a situation like that? You don't. Right. So, it, what, what, would that be? Now, now I'm kind of getting into the, the sort of more like, how can we help you? Right. right. What would there? Is there a way, or would there be a, a a value in some sort of, say, you know, lidar arranging? heads up, some, you know, night vision, I, I don't know, you know, some kind of vision system that could mm -hmm. give you your, you know, your dimensionality, where the walls are, where the doors are, right. ceiling height, things like that. Um, no, the only thing that we have is the thermal imaging camera, mm -hmm. which will read the, either the body heat off the people or where the fire is. Um, but that's all we have. So if there was, if there was something better that would help us be able to get out of a smoke-filled building. Now, you'd have to take in consideration that if you go into an abandoned building or a building under construction, you have to be more careful because, you know, that thermal imaging camera is only so good, mm -hmm. you don't see the hole in the ground. Right. And if you're crawling, you're not feeling it, and you get 
so attached to the thermal imaging camera, you go right through the hole. Mm -hmm. So that's something that would have to be taken into consideration. Do you, do you ever get like tunnel vision using the camera? Absolutely. Uh, we had a fire years ago when one of my friends was using the thermal imaging camera and it went dead on him and just stopped working. He's like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Well, you go back to the private, you go back to your search. What you do, but when you're in that situation, you got light sirens flashing and everything, fire people trapped. It just sometimes it goes out of your mind. We're human like everybody else. So, so going back to the trap, so you probably heard of what happened, and I believe it was Hackensack the, a couple years ago. I heard the story of it where the building collapsed on them, and like I don't know. If you're you talking about the Ford dealership in 1988? Yeah, I heard the story about it, but like, do you guys have some sort of a panic button anywhere? No, if if we want the evacu if we want the building evacuated, that's up to the incident commander, and we will send out over the radio evacuation tones, and we will also sound the air horn on the apparatus for um, I think a minute, a minute and a half, so everybody hears it, and everybody just drops their tools or hoses, whatever, gets out of the building. So like, so say for example, he, a firefighter falls, is there like a way, like say he can't speak, but he can hit a button? Okay, there, like well, that. actually, there is a uh, good, that's a great question. There's uh, on the SEVA, there's a, what's called a pass device. And what that does is after 30 seconds of no motion, it will sound an audible alarm. So we will go track the audible alarm. Now, there's also a, what we have is a uh, air pack tracker. And that can work for locating the downed firefighter a little easier. It, it just It's kind of like a um, game of hot and cold. It'll tell you if you're getting hotter and closer to that firefighter that's down. So like an RF thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so j just like an idea, would something like the thermal imaging camera, but like more like almost built into like the helmet that you guys would wear? Or it's already like built that? into our mask. Okay. Yep. Does the thermal imaging only track where like the fire like originated, like the source of it, or does it also like see like the areas? It just it? it just sees heat. It doesn't tell you where the fire originated. It's just gonna uh, differentiate heat from cold. And I'll show you that when we go outside. Um, do you think that the communication system more like uh like let, more like how when you're like on the phone and anyone can talk and no one has to like wait for someone else to finish talking would be uh, useful like does that, make, does that make sense uh it does i mean you do get cut off a lot when you're trying to radio something and somebody else gets on the radio a split second before you mm -hmm. and you can't communicate then you just you know they didn't hear you or dispatch didn't hear you so that is an area of concern that we have do you have like any issues like say being overran by dispatch like if you need like just like fire fire communication like for example you need to tell someone you need more hose line and dispatch we have an, well we have a dispatch channel and we have an operations channel like a situational uh and, well just just operate so in, on the operations channel we can call to dispatch but mostly we're talking to the firefighters if another call comes over it's going to come over in the dispatch frequency and so that won't interfere with the uh, operations is it also possible, like, when you show us, like, the other stuff, that we can see your walkie-talkies, too? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe now, maybe it seems like a good time. What do you, what do yeah, you we can do that. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. 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 The floor might be wet out here, guys.